dear participants, friends, colleagues, I'm delighted and excited uh, to open the first session of the conference on the grand challenges in the chemical sciences. I noted yesterday that the current gathering is the jewel in the crown in the scientific festivities for the 70th birthday of Israel with the richness, riches of topics and the fantastic participants. Yesterday, we enjoyed the opening lecture by Joshua Yortner and the film of, on uh, Professor Farkash, one of the forefathers of the chemical sciences at the Hebrew University. And now, uh, we start our scientific sessions opening with a subject of drug discovery. Drug discovery emanating from basic science exemplifies an exciting combination between the two facets of sciences. First and foremost, the quest for truth and the eternal desire to know ourselves and the world we live in. And secondly, the wish to contribute to the welfare of society and the world at large, which is occasionally a byproduct of the first facet. Actually, the film we saw yesterday exposed these two facets in the scientific work of a Professor Farkash. The chair of the session, Michael Sella, former president of the Weizmann Institute, and Ruth Arnon, former president of the Academy, with their student, Deborah Teitelbaum, accomplished very successfully this dual goal through the discovery and development of Copaxone treating multiple sclerosis. A fantastic combination of scientific discovery which assists humanity at large. So we are proud to have them here. And uh, let us applaud again Rafi Levin, Joshua Yortner, Itamar Vilner, Danny Schechtman, Galia Finzi, Manny Kirma for the efforts, enthusiasm, and thoughtfulness. I wish us all prosperous discussions. Thank you. And please, Michael. I was looking forward that I will have the opportunity of introducing Richard Lerner, whom I did already on several continents. But a couple of days ago, Rafi Levine called me that Richard Lerner has pneumonia, delicate rayot, and is not able to come. So would I talk instead of him and not instead? I don't have anything prepared, but I'm willing to continue a little bit what in such a beautiful way Joshua Yortner started. And maybe the first thing I want to mention, continuing Joshua, who mentioned that the first professor of chemistry at the Hebrew University was Professor Andor Fodor. Now, as I know, in 1925, when Andor Fodor was appointed as professor, he was the first professor in any discipline at the Hebrew University. But it was in chemistry. And I did my Master of Science with Andor Fodor, so I can say a few things more personal. He worked for many years with Abderhalden in Halle and Zale. And Halle and Zale became the seat, it was always the seat of Leopoldine Academy and became the official academy of the German state. A couple of years ago, 
I uh, was asked to talk to young high school students in parts of Germany about the beginning of the scientific relation between Germany and Israel. And on that occasion, a whole series of people, old people who were obviously students of Abderhalden, who tried to convince me, I didn't know anything about it, but he was apparently a committed Nazi and did all kinds of bad things. And they tried to convince me that he actually was a very nice person, which I didn't doubt, but I didn't get involved into this kind of discussion. Now, Fodor may have been, as uh, Joshua yesterday suggested, a believer in colloidal chemistry, so maybe he didn't believe much in proteins, but he certainly believed a lot in peptides because his claim to fame was that he prepared a series of peptides and he synthesized a peptide of 19 amino acids, which was the biggest achievement and which is probably the reason he received then a professorship in, uh, in Halle and der Saale. Now, uh, I knew him well in his old age. His language was definitely German, not Hungarian. And he loved to write plays in German on classical Greek themes in the Alexandrine verse. De facto, the person with whom I worked then, I talk about the period of 1941 to 1945 was Noah Liechtenstein, afterwards professor. And Noah Liechtenstein came, studied in Zurich with Professor Karer. And one thing that he learned from Karer, and I must say he taught me, is how important is order and precision, even in matters not only of chemistry. Now, I'm not going through a systematic series. I jump directly to Aaron and Ephraim Kachalski. The two brothers, Aaron was mentioned a lot yesterday, but the two brothers who started by studying biology and moved to chemistry with a lot of physical chemistry. I still remember the evening we all spent together studying tensors, Hamiltonians, and so on. In the end, Aaron, both ended up with polymers. Aaron with polyelectrolytes and Ephraim with polyamino acids. Aaron was my joke about Aaron, which I told him always, that if at four o'clock at night you would wake him up and tell him the next door is a group of 1,000 people and he has to speak about the origin of shtetl and the Pale of Russia, he would do it splendidly. He was a wonderful speaker who gave to everybody the impression that they understood everything he said, which was very rarely true. On the other hand, Ephraim, who was my mentor, and then became over the years my close friend. Ephraim was actually the one that started models of proteins, and these protein models were polymers of amino acids, which sounds very easy, but it's actually very difficult because you have to prepare the monomers in certain ways, necessitating phosgene, necessitating a little building in the middle of an orange grove, 
where one specialist was successful in making these monomers. In my case, while I made many polymers, but the most important was polytyrosine, the polymer of tyrosine. But I want now to jump over 70 years or more. Very recently, I don't, I saw it online, but I don't know whether it has been already published in the University of Aarhus, a physician treating for years patients against multiple sclerosis with copaxone, which is a po linear polymer of amino acids, paid attention that these patients who received copaxone never had any infections caused by gram-negative bacteria. So he tested for several years otherwise healthy people with copaxone and found that copaxone destroys totally gram-negative bacteria. Now, with a little bit of imagination and maybe fantasy, maybe in 30 to 50 years, where all the antibiotics will not work anymore because all the bacteria will be uh, st no, standing against it, maybe polymers of amino acids will have a major role in fighting bacteria. And I say this because it's one way of, for me, to express my admiration for Ephraim Kaczalski, who became Katsir only after his brother was murdered by Japanese terrorists in the airport of Tel Aviv. And as Aaron changed his name to Katsir much earlier than Ephraim, when he became the president of Israel, changed his name to Katsir in memory of his brother. Now, in my case, if all these polymers of amino acids are supposed to be models of proteins, then among many other characteristics, one characteristic of protein is that they can produce in animals or in humans antibodies. Therefore, I ask myself whether the polymers of amino acids will indeed provoke the pro production of antibodies. And uh, the answer was, of course, positive. But I'll give you just one example. If you take gelatin, a very ill-defined product of destroying collagen, and it, co it was considered then a very, very poor antigen, and I could attach to it short peptides, it really by polymeric techniques of tyrosine. If we injected, we attached 3% tyrosine, it became a very good antigen making antibodies to gelatin. If we attach 10% tyrosine, became a very good antigen, but all the antibodies were against tyrosine peptides. So I needed a definition of distinguishing between what I call an immunogenicity and antigenic specificity. Both of them were very good immunogen, but they had totally different specificity. That's how I started the notion of immunogen and immunogenicity. Today there are probably at least 30 companies which have in their title immunogen, immunogenicity, but I must say it started I'm talking about six years ago. Now, by the way, again, Ruth Arnon will speak about cop Copaxon for 
multiple sclerosis. But uh, uh, when I, I received the Israel Prize, and everybody talks today that I received it for Copaxon, but Copaxon, we started working on it 15 years later. The prize were given for synthetic antigens. It was given in 1959, which is, by the way, 59 years ago, when I was 35. So I'm both the youngest, uh, in terms of age, recipient of Israel Prize, and the oldest still alive, because I was so young then. Uh, now, in, I came to it in a completely different way, and it took me tens of years to realize that what we started was quantitative molecular immunology. And by the way, we are missing uh, Richard Lerner, who is certainly a main protagonist of this approach, uh, which made it. Uh, by the way, uh, a general remark to chemists in a meeting of chemistry. All the important results in biology, which converted, were done by chemists. And the chemists did it. Now, I brought one slide, just as an example. It's one of these things that I myself usually forget. But can I have this one slide? I will tell you, in 1924, which is the year I was born, I'm now 94, uh, Harrington and Pitt Rivers in England have defined totally the formula of tyroxine, which is tetrayodotyronine. I, I thought that I need this. So this was known for years, but nobody would, could say whether it's a dismutation which would lead to glycine or an oxidation which will lead to serine. Because even a very concentrated solution of diodotyrosine, the distance from one molecule to another was too big. Only when we had polytyrosine and iodinated it, we had the same polymer which included tyrosine, monoiodotyrosine, and diodotyrosine. <laughs> and after overnight and mild alkaline solution, we got 2% tyroxine and 2% serine, meaning that it was a disputation, it was an oxidation. This was, I published it in Nature, and I was, it was so far that I realize now that in several books or things of 100 pages, I never mentioned it even. But now it comes back. So I wanted to show you a typical, purely chemical results of this. Now, one other word. Game protein chemistry. That's why I realize more and more that I'm a chemist, and while they define me as immunologist, I always say protein chemist and immunologist. And indeed, after working for so many years with protein models, I said it's time to work with proteins. And I went to NIH, to Chris Anfinson to work on ribonuclease. A ribonuclease is an enzyme which has four disulfide bridges. You can open it, and as a latest study with my close friend, the late Schneur-Lifson, 
if it would be equal, there should be 101 possibilities to close the bridges back. But in my case, again, the only protein which does not contain tryptophan is ribonuclease. So you can open the bridges by performing acid oxidation. Otherwise, if tryptophan is back, everything becomes a black tar. So you have to open it by reduction. And then, while continuing the study, I decided to leave one portion not blocked immediately, but overnight, and it appears that all the activity of ribonuclease came back. Uh, I was just a postdoc in Chris' lab, and I was very happy when Chris received the Nobel Prize mainly for this. This is the beginning, the simplistic beginning of how proteins are structured and they gain. But now it's an extremely busy field of study, but I just wanted to mention it also because it gives me the opportunity to mention Schneeulifson, who was a great guy and a great friend.